August 1st. My hands are getting so rough and callous from all the picking and shoveling that they feel like sandpaper. When I itched a flybite on my chin this afternoon, I felt some beard stubble. Pa says it won't be long before I'm shaving. Today we passed a broken up wagon box and a pile of oxen bones that were picked clean of every bite of hide and hair. August 10th. We now have to haul our water 50 miles. It takes a full-time crew to keep the big tanks on the flat cars filled. The only good thing about this place is that it's too hot and dry for rattlesnakes, so Coughlin has canceled my morning scouting. August 11th. A fight broke out between the graders and the track layers today. The track men have been pushing the grading crew lately, and bad feelings have been building. It's so easy for them to lay their rails on these flats that we can't stay ahead of them. It started after lunch. The chuck wagon had just left, and the graders were busy moving their equipment. When one of our mule skinners didn't pull a scraper ahead fast enough to suit Mac O'Grady, he shouted, Clear those nags out of the way so we men can get to work. That really set the graders off. Their heads all wheeled, and a tough fellow called Frank Stranahan spit in the dirt and cussed O'Grady. Next thing I knew, both groups were charging each other with their fists cocked. Hats were flying and mules were jerking white-eyed at their bits. Not, e not one even noticed when an unbrake wagon rattled off on its own. I was so sunned by the sound of a fist cracking into the jaw of a man next to me that I barely had time to duck a as a punch was thrown my way. Casement cracked his bullwhip over the heads of the men, but they wouldn't back off until he finally emptied his six-shooter into the air. Though they grumbled at one another for the rest of the day, there were no more fisticuffs. After dinner, those same men were sharing a drink of whiskey and chuckling over their blackened eyes. As they laughed at their own foolishness, I couldn't help but think back to how bull-raging mad they were. If they hadn't thrown down their spike mulls and shovels before they went at it, I know there would have been someone dead on the tracks. August 15th. Mr. Caseman is getting fed up with the excursionists. I think he hates them even more than Pa, and that's saying a heap. You'd think they'd leave us alone way out here, but just when we think we've seen the last of them, a new lot shows up at the end of the track. It's always the same sort, too. Professors and fancy laders, ladies and reporters and company officials all dressed up and itching to see the track layers at work so they can go back east and brag to everyone that they got a first-hand view of the modern wonder of the world, the Transcontinental Railroad. Useless gawkers, I heard Casement call them today. August 20th, Creston, Wyoming, mile 737. According to the engineers, we've just laid our tracks across the Continental Divide. But it is still so flat that if the surveyors hadn't told us that we'd reach the place where the two watersheds meet, I never would have guessed. Casement is getting his two miles a day and then some. I got a letter from John last week, but things have been moving so fast around here that it took me until tonight to write back. September 1st. We laid 65 miles of track last month, but Pa says Durant is pushing for more. Rumors are that the CP is going even faster than we are. Though the mountains held the CP back a long time, the fellows say that they've reached a flat desert in Nevada and are going great guns. The men are quick to shoot their mouths off. Tonight at supper, Bill Flanagan said, No bunch of Chinamen is going to show us up, and everyone nodded their head. September 6th, Sunday. The days are getting shorter, but Casement isn't letting a little thing like darkness slow us down. We are working by moonlight, and when the moon isn't out, we string lamps along the grade. Sometimes we light piles of sagebrush to help see our way. The smoke burns my eyes, and it's hard to breathe when the wind is strong. One day last week, our crews worked from dawn to dusk and put down six miles of track. That'll show them, everyone said. But a few days later, we heard that the CP had laid seven miles in only 14 hours. September 18th. I got a letter from John today. He took a whole page to describe his geography, geography teacher, and as usual... He cheered me up. Dear Sean, school has started up again, and you are sure lucky that you're working on the railroad instead of doing these dumb lessons. We got a new geography teacher named Mr. Simpson, who expects us to know every single state in the Union, along with all the capitals and state flags. I've only been in school a week, but my head is already crammed full. He says by the end of the year, we will know every country and ocean in the world. And he wasn't joking. Nobody likes him because he is always showing off how smart he is. Being that he just finished high school last spring, he should know more than us kids. 
the only good thing he's done so far is to give us all a laugh on the second day of school. It happened when he was waving his pointer at the map and telling us all about San Francisco. Robert Hawkins flicked a spitwad at the side blackboard, and Simpson spun around real quick to try to catch him. His pointer knocked over an ink bottle, which spilled right onto Susie McDougall's lap and ruined her pretty yellow dress. She must be a very unlucky person, because if you recall from the letter I wrote you last winter, she was the one who broke her arm on our hayride. Then Simpson made it worse by trying to dog up, daub up the ink with his handkerchief, and Susie started crying, and he got so flustered that he wiped his forehead and inked himself all up. We thought that would slow him down a bit, but he just keeps piling on the work. Your brother, the scholar, John. I miss school a lot when I hear stories like that. Maybe I can save up my money and go to college some day. I know mom would have wanted me to continue my schooling, and a suit and tie job would sure beat shoveling in the smoke in the dark. September 19th. For the last week, we've been building our grade alongside a stagecoach line. We're going faster than ever. But every traveler we talk to says the CP is doing the same or better. The race is getting tighter for sure. October 1st, Green River, Wyoming, mile 845. There is a huge mesa just outside of town called Citadel Rock. The base of it slopes gradually, with shallow, shallow gullies traveling away on all sides. But the top half shoots straight up into the sky. The rock looks like a fat knife handle decorated with alternate stripes of pink and red and brown. I wonder what the view is like from the top. I'll bet I could see all the way back to Chicago. We're finally into patches of timber again. It feels so good to see some green and have a few hills around to break up the awful flatness. October 4th. As strange as it might sound, I felt a little closed in the last few days. Though I was itching to get away from that empty desert, I must have gotten used to all the openness without knowing it. Now every time I turn, there's a hill or a tree. Everything seems crowded and squeezed in tight. October 7th. I'm getting over that closed-in feeling. It's strange how a fellow can get used to anything. Even a thing like the desert that I hated in the worst way. October 15th. Granger, Wyoming. Our tracks crossed the Oregon Trail again today. Pa says that after running north of here, along the Sweetwater River and Big Sandy Creek, the trail loops south of our grade. When I asked him why the wagons didn't take a straighter route like the railroad does, he shook his head and said, Remember the Red Desert? It was dumb of me not to figure that one out. Thinking back to the sun-bleached skulls and oxen bones we'd seen on the Al Alkali Flats, I realized that anyone with half a brain would rather drive a wagon team 50 miles out of their way than end up dead. Pa says that wagon travel is also easier to the north because the foothills rise more gradually up there. Even here, the Oregon Trail is littered with broken wagon parts and cast-off furniture. I can't begin to imagine everything those wagons have cast aside between here and where they started back in places like Independence, Missouri, which Pa says is nearly a thousand miles away. Every article must have meant a whole lot to someone to tote it this far, and it must have hurt plenty to leave it behind. This morning, my crew found a wooden grave marker in the middle of the right-of-way. Carved out of a buckboard seat, it was so weathered and gray that it looked 50 years old. But the date scratch across the top read 1855 to 1863. The rest of the words, which I could only partly read, said something about Ohio and a girl named Sarah Jo. Dying young has got to be the saddest thing in this whole world. Though it is tough when a grown-up like my mother dies, there is something more cruel in the death of a child. You can't help asking, why her, and imagining what she might have become. Between here and Omaha, I've seen hundreds of graves, just like that little girl's. They are marked with whatever the families could find at hand. Rough boards, or sticks, or piles of stones. And even the hottest day, they sent up a quick chill on my spine. Our crew was start staring at the marker, and wondering what to do when Coughlin came up. Let's get on with it, boys, he said, as he wrenched that board out of the dust and tossed it off to the side without even breaking his stride. When I talked to Pa after supper and told him what a mean thing Coughlin had done, he just shook his head and said, What's a man going to do? Though I know they can't change the survey of this road to steal around a little girl's grave, I wish someone would have at least paused to say a few words to honor her soul. I just pray that those travelers laid her deep enough so that she won't be disturbed by all the men and the machines. October 25th. 
Tomorrow we are taking a shot at the track-laying record. According to the news we get from the papers and from fellows who have traveled this way from Sacramento, it's been a seesaw battle between us and the CP all month. We aim to hit her hard at dawn and show them once and for all what we can do. Pa said there are spies working on our line, who are getting paid to tell the CP just how fast we're moving. I suspect the UP is probably doing the same thing. October 26th. Today I felt like I joined the circus. There were photo- photographers and newspaper reporters and a passel of spectators who came from back east. Pa called them useless fancy folks. The ladies wore frilly dresses and held parasols to keep off the sun. The fellows were dressed in suits and stovepipe hats. With everyone staring at every move we made, it made me feel like a new animal that had just arrived at the zoo. A skinny fellow who was puffing on a big cigar tapped me on the shoulder and asked, "'What's your job, Sonny?' I got tongue-tied, trying to explain that I was just there to help if I was needed, when Pa saved me by saying, "'He's my assistant, sir.' Then he whispered, I'm itching to hand those fellows a shovel, Sean, and tell them to make themselves useful. I grinned then, and Bill Flanagan, who had overheard Pa's comment, said, I wouldn't advise it, Patty. They'd probably just hurt themselves, or worse, damage good equipment. We had a good laugh at that. We had breakfast at 4 a.m. Getting up that early isn't so bad if you don't have to listen to Jimmy Flynn carry on. Pa had asked me to stand ready to replace anyone who got tuckered out. I doubted that any of the men would need relief, but I was excited to have a chance to watch the show. I've never seen the fellows work so fast. Before the dust had even settled on the newly set ties, the tenders were clamping their tongs to the rails and rolling them off the beds of the horse carts, and no sooner had the rails clanged down than the spike malls were ringing out. I heard a newspaper reporter off to the side reducing the whole track-laying operation to numbers as he spoke with a lady friend. Five men to a rail, three blows to a spike, Thirty spikes to a rail, four hundred rails to the mile, he said, making it sound as simple as drawing a line across a map. I guess when you're not doing any real work, you've got the time to count. I hope when he writes his article, he mentioned that those rails weigh 560 pounds each. That's nearly a quarter of a million pounds of lifting for every single mile we put down. The Teamsters were working their horses so hard, bringing the rails forward, that they had to fit, hitch fresh animals to their supply carts twice during the morning. The only thing that stalled things a bit was lack of water. Three separate times our track-laying materials were held up when the locomotives ran dry and overheated. Once an engine lost her steam pressure, and the firebox got so hot that it glowed cherry red. Everyone was afraid she was going to melt down or blow, so some fellows and I helped Ben douse the boiler fire with buckets from his water wagon. But as soon as she cooled down, the firemen filled the reservoir and stoked her back up. By late afternoon, it was clear that we would set the record, so the fellows wasted a little time laughing and bragging like you would expect. Then, just as they, we were getting ready to quit, Mac O'Grady teased me. You want to see if you can bust another mall, boy, he said. I stood there not knowing what to say. My face reddened up, and I couldn't decide whether I felt more like cussing him out or running off to hide. Pa and all the spikers were watching as O'Grady pointed the handle of his mall toward me and said, What do you say? I had no choice but to step forward. I set up like Michael Kennedy had shown me last time and bent down to start the spike. When I stood up, my heel caught on the crown of the rail, and I almost tripped. The boys behind me chuckled, and I felt my hands turn hot and sweaty. I swung them all back and then tried to drop it down smooth like I'd seen the spikers doing all day long. I surprised myself by hitting the spike flush. At that moment, I realized that swinging a pick on the grading crew all those days had improved both my strength and my aim. Why, it was nothing to hit a fat spike head when I'd been nailing tiny cracks and hollows with the sharp end of a pick for days on end. I hammered the spike flush with my fifth swing, and the rail rang out with a loud ping. That was two more strokes than the best strikers take, but I knew I could get better with practice. A few of the fellows cheered, and even O'Grady let out a humph that indicated I'd done a passable job. Off the side, I heard Mr. Casement, who was standing next to Pa, say... Looks like we found ourselves another spiker, Patrick. When the dust finally settled, we had put down seven and three-fourths miles of trail. Let those China boys have a crack at that, Mac O'Grady said, as he swaggered off toward the dining car. Everyone nodded their heads in agreement. And as much as I hate that blowhard, he's probably right. I can't imagine anyone beating our record. October 27th. I just heard that Charlie Crocker 
the construction chief of the CP, has accepted UP Vice President Durant's $10,000 bet that the CP can't beat our single-day record. Crocker said that he wanted to pick the time and the place, and Durant agreed. Crocker claims they'll have a 10-mile day. All I've got to say is, that's a far piece to walk in a day's time, much less lay rails. Pa laughed when he heard about the bet. Crocker can't boil enough tea to keep those Chinamen going that long, he said. I don't know how Pa can have so many strong opinions about the Chinese, being that the only Chinese he knows are a family named Pan who run a laundry back in Chicago. October 29th. I'm not a spiker yet. That would have been way too much to ask. But I am working as a rail tender. I can see why Pa started me off as a water carrier. Having these 560-pound rails around is a heck of a lot harder than lifting water butts, buckets. And I thought that was tough work when I first got out here. VP Durant has been hovering around all the crews. He's asking questions and giving orders all the time. Today, I heard him tell General Casement that if we can average two miles of track per day, we should be able to do three. I bet that fellow doesn't know how to do much more than carry his money bags to the bank. November 3rd. Caseman hasn't paid us for two weeks. Pa says the blowhards from back east, like Durant, have fouled up the finances of the UP so bad that the railroad is short of cash. Whatever the reason, the men are getting more ornery every day. November 11th. I heard about a town just up ahead called Bear River City, which is even wilder than Julesburg. Bill says that the citizens have formed a committee to cut back on the violence. Yesterday, they hung a gunman named Little Jack O'Neill and two of his buddies. Executing people without a fair trial seems like a strange way to stop violence. November 14th. Working as an iron man, loading rails and rolling them off the cart is tricky business. It takes perfect timing for the four of us to clamp our tongs on a rail and drop it in place. If I lift late, the fellows give me a good cussing, and if I lift too early, I risk gripping my back. But the most important thing is to watch your feet. When they sing out, down, that rail is going down whether you're ready or not, and you better get your boots clear. A rail tender named Peter McGinney got his toes caught under a rail last week, and he yelled like a gunshot coyote. No one blamed him for yelling either, because 560 pounds of iron can mash up a foot so bad that you can't hardly recognize it. November 16th. Mac O'Grady finally got what he deserved today. He was picking on the younger fellows like he always does, teasing and calling them names. But no one paid him any mind until he started in on Peter McKinney. Poor McKinney was just getting so he could limp around in an oversized boot that was padded with bandages, and he was anxious to help lay the, help the track layers. He said he needed to get back on the payroll so he could send money to his wife and eight kids in St. Louis. He was doing all he could, opening spike kegs, handing the fellows their malls and the like. That's when O'Grady walked over and set the head of his spike mall right on top of McKinney's bad foot. The weather's getting a bit cool, ain't it, Pete? He said, leaning on the handle of his mall to see how much pressure McKinney could stand. That's when Pa stepped in. Leave him be, Mac, Pa said. Mind your own business, Patty, he said. You ain't his mother. Pa walked right over without another word and grabbed that spike mall out of O'Grady's hand and tossed it down. You could see the relief on McKinney's face when the pressure eased, and I thought that would be the end of it, but O'Grady was piping mad. He shoved Pa back and took a swing. I opened my mouth to warn Pa, but he'd already seen the fist coming and blocked it with his left hand. Then, instead of punching O'Grady like he'd expect, he gave him a quick backhand, and then another. His hands flashed out so quick, they were a blur. Right, left, right. O'Grady's head snapped back each time. I could see that O'Grady was knocked out on his feet, so I yelled, Stop, Pa, and caught him by the shoulder. Pa whirled with a wild-eyed look, and for an instant, I thought he might take a swing at me. Then he was back to himself and apologizing for losing control. O'Grady woke up a bit later, covered with dust, but no worse for the wear. Tonight, when I opened my journal, I realized where Pa's anger came from. Today would have been his anniversary again. If only someone had warned Mac O'Grady to be better behaved for just one day. November 18th. The last two days, Mac O'Grady has been so polite that I don't hardly recognize him. November 19th. Bear River City, Wyoming. 
All hell broke loose yesterday. Pardon my swearing, but what happened over in Bear River City today made the fight between Pa and Mac O'Grady look like a ladies' tea party. Bear Town, as the locals call the place, had sprung up just beyond the end of the track. The gamblers and fancy ladies and saloon keepers had set up shop, but for a change, they weren't the cause of the trouble. The fellows who started it all are two brothers named Lee and Richmond Freeman. They've been following us road builders for a long while, toting a one-ton printing press, which the UP carried for free on its train, and publishing a newspaper called The Frontier Index. A lot of the fellows have been riled up about the things they've put in their paper lately, criticizing the UP. Ben gets especially sad when he hears what the Freemans have spouted off about Negroes being subhuman and not deserving their freedom. In a way, I'm almost glad that Ben can't read. The stuff in the Freeman's paper is that ugly. Well, this time the Freemans went overboard. They printed an editorial saying that Ulysses S. Grant was a whiskey-bloated, squaw-ravishing adulterer and a nigger-worshipping mogul. I don't know what a mogul is, and I don't think most of the other UP men do either, but we all know what the rest means. Since a good portion of our men served under Grant during the war, they don't take kindly to such insults. However, what really put them over the edge was the evil things those Freemans wrote about President Lincoln. Not only did they call Lincoln filthy and lecherous, but they went so far as to say that John Wilkes Booth did a good deed by assassinating him. As mean-spirited as those words were, if the men had stayed sober, and if they'd been paid on time, everything might have turned out okay. But Caseman is a full month behind on our wages now, and once the men got liquored up, there was no stopping them. When the trouble started, Pa and I were walking past the little board and batten shack that called itself the R.R. House Restaurant. I heard some yelling and looked up the street. There must have been 200 fellows headed toward the Freeman's office. They were a fearsome sight, swinging axe handles and spike malls and yelling at people to clear out of their way. Even though I wanted to follow along and see what happened, Pa got me out of there quick. A few minutes later, I was glad he did. We weren't halfway back to the work train when I heard the first shots. There were just a couple of flat cracks that sounded like a Colt 44. I didn't think much of it because gunfire isn't unusual in a frontier town. Then, all of a sudden, it sounded like a whole army was letting loose. Six shooters and shotguns and rifles were popping off so fast it could have been a gatling gun. Good Lord, Pa whispered and shook his head. I think all the shooting reminded him of the war, because he turned as pale as I'd ever seen him. November 20th. I found out where the shooting came from. According to Bill Flanagan, who took a slug in the forearm and looks like he'll be laid up for a while, the UP men stormed into the Freeman's office and smashed it up. But when they stepped back out into the street, a bunch of town vigilantes opened up on them. Twenty-five men were killed. Dozens more were wounded. The sad thing is that the UP just dug a big hole and buried all those fellows together. No service, no markers, no nothing. Pa said that the railroad wanted to keep it quiet. Two fellows who they didn't hush up were those snakes, the Freemans. Somebody tipped them off before the UP men got to their office, and they sneaked off like the cowards they are. I can't believe that the railroad expects to get away with piling a bunch of shot-up bodies into an open grave. Those men were pounding spikes and slurping down coffee yesterday, yet today it's like they were never alive. One of them, Charlie O'Farrell, was the finest clog dancer and singer I've ever seen. His voice was so pure that he could make me smile just by saying, Top of the morning, Sean. I know for a fact that he's got a girl back in Kerry, Ireland, and he was saving up money to send for her. Are we supposed to pretend that he just disappeared? I tried to write this all in a letter to John, but it was hard to find words to describe the sadness and anger I'm feeling. I know if Indians had killed those fellows... Every newspaper in this country would be scrambling to print the story with a fat headline. There would have been a heap of bad news then. November 23rd. I've been checking the papers every chance I get, and the UP must be doing a good job of covering things up, because there is barely a word about what they are calling the Bear River Riot. Mr. Casement decided to teach the Bear River City people a lesson. Instead of building a siding, a branch of the track, into town like the UP usually does, we laid our tracks straight on by. Those local businessmen are probably upset, but they should have thought a bit before they shot up our men. November 26th. 
I celebrated my second Thanksgiving on the railroad today. It sure was nice of President Lincoln to start this holiday back up again. We got part of the afternoon off, and the cooks gave us an extra nice meal with biscuits and real gravy, instead of just pot drippings. Pa took me to a pie shop that a lady had set up in a tent, and I got a big piece of pumpkin pie. Though the crust was a bit chewy, I'm not about to complain. I wrote Aunt Katie a letter and told her how much I miss her and her lemon cream pies. November 28th, Aspen Station, Wyoming, mile 937. I can see why they call this place Aspen. The trees are covered with solid strands of aspen trees. Last month there must have been golden leaves rippling all over these slopes, but now everything has gone gray. The trunks and branches are just bare sticks poking up into the sky. Back home our oaks hold on to their leaves well into the winter, and leaves us with, leave us with a splash of color to remember summer by. If there weren't a few evergreens to break up the grayness of these mountains, this wouldn't look much better than the desert country we left behind. Just east of town, between here and a place called Piedmont, we cross the Oregon Trail for what Pot says will be the last time. In the short, rutted stretch of the road that I could see, I counted two graves, a broken wagon wheel, a discarded chest of drawers, and a brand new baby's cradle. December 4th, Easton, Wyoming, mile 955. The weather is turning colder every day. Though it was ugly working in the Dale Creek Gorge last winter, at least it was sheltered. Here, the wind hits you from all sides. We've been back in the bunk car for a week now, and the fellow who sleeps across from us has been coughing all night and keeping everyone awake. They've shipped in a newfangled steam shovel to work in the rougher cuts. When that machine is digging, you can feel the earth shake a hundred yards away. The chains and pulleys make a terrible racket, but it's amazing how much dirt it can move. The bucket is bigger than three good-sized men. Yesterday, a half-dozen fellows posed for a picture, standing out on a boom of that steam shovel. I kept thinking, what if those gears slip? But they just set their hands on their hips and stared straight at the camera, looking as if they didn't have a care in the world. If the UP gets many more fancy machines, they won't need any more pick-and-shovel men. Pa says they've ordered a steam-driven pile driver, too. Maybe they'll even build a machine to pound spikes some day. December 5th. Everyone is hoping for an open winter, but it is already snowing hard enough to hold up the trains. The mail is so slow that it takes us two or three weeks to get a letter from Chicago.